Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Alex Mazzudi. He is an Associate Professor of Cultural Evolution at the Human Behavior and Cultural Evolution Group at the University of Exeter's Cornwall campus in the UK. He studies cultural evolution, both in the lab and by constructing models and simulations of it. He is also the author of the book Cultural Evolution, How Darwinian Theory Can Explain Human Culture and Synthesize the Social Sciences. So, Dr. Mazzudi, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me, Ricardo. Okay, so let me first ask you, and uh, I always ask this question whenever I have someone on the show who does work on cultural evolution, because I think it's a real fundamental question. We, we have to get this right from the very beginning. That is, first of all, what is culture? How do you define it? And, and also a follow-up to that would be, uh, how do you look at the relationship between uh, culture, whatever, uh, uh, however you define it, and biology? Yeah, very important questions to um, uh, uh, establish, I think. So, I mean, culture has been defined in literally hundreds of different ways across the social sciences and the biological sciences. I guess I would describe myself as fitting into both of those. Um, I guess I would define culture in a very broad sense, um, simply as uh, everything that is socially learned from one individual to another. So we're thinking about things like um, attitudes, customs, beliefs, knowledge, um, semantic knowledge like what is the capital of Portugal, through to how to play tennis, anything where one individual learns something from another individual through maybe processes like imitation or spoken or written language um, uh, or teaching, for example. So I guess the big distinction is with genetically inherited information. So um, culture is not gene, uh, genetic information that we acquire from our parents. It's things that we acquire via social learning that occurs from one, one brain to another. Um, and so I guess you can, so that's the, a very broad definition, that's non-human specific for me. So I would say that uh, many species have culture in that sense. Chimpanzees learn nutcracking from other individuals within their groups. Um, rats learn food preferences by sniffing each other's breath. Um, so you can think of all of these uh, many, many non-human species, insects, uh, fish, very mammal species as um, having culture in this sense of learning from one individual to another. I guess we also often think about maybe uh, def uh, higher level definitions perhaps, so we can think about cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. um, so these are uh, group typical patterns of behavior that might differ from one group to another. Mm -hmm. So in humans, we might think of, say, uh, using chopsticks in one country, say Japan, versus using knives and forks in um, the UK. So these are socially learned, so they're examples of culture, but they're between group differences on average, um, not absolute and not sort of essentialized, but group tendencies uh, that result from people learning to use knives and forks from individuals in one society and learning to use chopsticks in another society. This also applies to other species, I think. So, again, um, Andy Whiten and various people have done lots of work on chimpanzee cultural traditions where some groups of chimps not crack, uh, crack uh, use um, nut, uh, stones to open nuts. Other groups of chimpanzees don't, and it doesn't seem to be the availability of nuts. It's that one group learned one technique from each other and another group didn't learn it or learned a different technique. Um, so cultural traditions are important. I guess the highest level maybe we can say is uh, this concept of cumulative culture that's got lots of attention in the field of evolution. This is where um, I guess what we learn accumulates in complexity somehow across the generations. So if we think in humans of, um, I don't know, um, telephones, it's gone from um, sort of 
it's, it's relatively simple telephones, which you dial up through to smartphones and iPhones. So that's accumulation of complexity over generations. Um, and it, any other species shows convincing evidence for this cumulative culture. There's no sense in which chimpanzee nutcracking has got more and more complicated over chimpanzee generations. Um, so it seems like cumulative culture is um, perhaps unique to humans. So I guess, I guess the basic definition of culture is um, very broad, and then we can think about more, more specific, more detailed definitions of culture um, where necessary. Um, I guess your second question was the relationship between culture and biology. Mm -hmm. So I guess in, I guess you can also call the field of cultural evolution gene culture co-evolution, which is thinking about exactly that. How does culture and biology, if you want to identify biology with genetic evolution, um, how does genes and culture relate? And I guess in cultural evolution, lots of us are interested in how culture evolved. So um, you can think of culture, the ability to learn from one individual to another, that's a an evolved, a biologically evolved trait so characteristic um, so we can think about you know what are the adaptive functions of culture why is it biologically adaptive to have culture um, and we can also think about specific circumstances in which culture because it's to some degree independent of genetic evolution sometimes gives rise to maladaptive um, behavior. For example, when we're copying others who might be prestigious um, in a certain domain, we might also copy um, some maladaptive thing that they're doing or some arbitrary neutral thing. So um, I guess we can say that culture evolved, um, but culture also evolves. It's also a, uh, an evolutionary process in its own right that can sometimes lead to genetically maladaptive uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that relationship between biology and culture, uh, it is very difficult most of the time to understand if a particular behavior that is prevalent in a very specific society or that is higher in frequency in a given society is of cultural origins or of biological origin and then simply because uh, uh, that particular population was, for example, exposed to different ecological circumstances during its evolution, that simply uh, that kind of behavior spread over time in that population and that's why people exhibit it and it's not really necessarily socially learned or transmitted, right? I mean, th there are all different sorts of uh, phenomena that we encounter and some of them are more biologically based and others less and probably more uh, culturally transmitted or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Yeah, I think that's also important. So when I'm talking about behavioral differences between groups, I guess there are many different ways in which you can get behavioral differences between groups and culture. Social learning is only one way. Um, I think it's the most common way in, in humans, um, I would say, but um, I guess um, it's possible that there might be genetic differences between groups um, in behavior. Um, I think um, all the evidence suggests that genetic differences between groups is not a big driver of behavioral differences uh, between groups, simply because we're such a young species and we are rather genetically homogenous, and so there hasn't really been that much time for different groups to, to genetically evolve uh, to different environments. Um, I guess there are some examples like high altitude genetic adaptations in the Andes and in, in Tibet, um, or um, lactose tolerance is another, uh, another example. But when we're thinking, I guess, about psychological cognitive traits, I don't really think there's much evidence for genetic differences between uh, groups. Um, although, I guess, evolutionary um, psychologists um, talk about evoked culture. So I guess that's an important distinction. So the um, definition of culture I was talking about is uh, what they call transmitted culture or um, culture via social learning. I guess evolutionary psychologists and some cognitive anthropologists argue that we are sort of genetically 
all the same, but we have genetically evolved um, uh, capacities to differently in different ecological circumstances. Um, so this is the, kind of, the environment is evoking different behavior um, from our genome, if you like. So uh, lots of people have worked on, thought about things like pathogens. So some countries might have higher disease loads or in the past have had higher pathogen loads than other societies. And so some people argue that that might give rise to something like uh, in-group, strong in-group behavior in um, or collectivism in societies which have high pathogen loads or a history of high pathogen loads because if you're very in-group focused and mistrusting of out-groups then you're less likely to be exposed to um, pathogens that you haven't got immunity to um, and other people argue against that that hypothesis but I guess that's a case where um, it's environments evoking different uh, responses that might generate behavioral differences. I guess I would argue that it's the reason why I argue that most um, uh, behavioral differences between groups is probably cultural in the sense of socially learned or socially transmitted um, I guess is firstly the dissociation maybe between behavior and environment ecology so um, I was recently in uh, Meghalaya in northeast um, India um, accompanying people doing field work there and that's a, a matrilineal society where wealth goes down the female line and the youngest daughter inherits all the wealth and um, things that we um, uh, find quite um, strange in our patrilineal um, uh, society but the point is if you go across the border into Assam then it is patrilineal like the rest of India so very similar environments, very similar ecologies, but on one side of a border you have a matrilineal society, on the other side you have a patrilineal society. Or you might think of, I don't know, Korea, North Korea, South Korea, fairly similar environments, but dramatically different social um, social systems. So there are lots of these dissociations between environments and behavior that really um, the best example, the best explanation rather is that people are learning different uh, rules of inheritance or um, uh, rules of wealth inheritance, that kind of thing, different political systems from each other, and so we can attribute that to culture. Um, I guess another source of evidence is migration, which I've worked on a little bit recently. Uh, when you have migrants moving from one society to another, um, then often you get these acculturation effects where uh, migrants will shift or adopt the um, psychological or behavioral characteristics of the local society, their adopted society. Language is the best example. So kids whose parents don't speak, say, English, move to England, the kids grow up with perfect English accents. So uh, we can say that dialect or language is a culturally transmitted trait because immigrants moving from one society rapidly um, shift so that's kind of evidence against evidence for transmitted culture um, and evidence against um, these evoked uh, differences but you're right behavioral differences themselves are not necessarily cultural um, culture is one explanation for that Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, couldn't it be the case that another mechanism that would explain why different populations, even if they are, if they live in similar ecological conditions, have different sorts of culturally transmitted behavior would be some sort of cultural group selection in the sense that uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know exactly why and what factors would account for it, but uh, there would be different populations where uh, different behaviors would over time uh, bring out more successful strategies, for example, in organizing the society <coughs> and in, in for example, uh, intergroup conflict. Maybe there are certain ways of organizing societies in different conditions that uh, via uh, conflict or intergroup competition would lead certain societies toward particular types of cultures instead of others, w would that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's lots of work on cultural group selection. I guess it's um, slightly controversial, but um, uh, the theory works. I guess one of those cases where the theory works very well, as you just described it, um, it's a case of 
um, you actually have to collect evidence, sadly, to, to test theories, and I don't think the evidence is quite there. But yeah, absolutely. So in theory, you can have uh, people like Pete Richardson and Rob Boyd and Peter Turchin have made these arguments for cultural group selection, explaining in uh, between group differences. So you might have different solutions, um, the problem of cooperation, problem of dealing with free riders, which um, is a problem that all societies face, whether it's not building wells or not paying taxes or um, stealing from other people. You know, I guess these are free riding selfish behaviors that degrade, uh, make a, 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 a society less successful as a whole. So in theory, you want a society where you have no free riding. Um, and then if you have variation across societies in these cooperation related traits, um, uh, usually in these theories they're culturally transmitted these are sort of culturally transmitted um, norms or attitudes um, then in theory the more cooperative societies will out-compete the less cooperative societies because the former have better group defense and um, more taxes to pay armies if it's direct intergroup competition or if it's indirect even then ones that have more functioning Economies might outcompete ones where there's loads of corruption and um, uh, people not paying taxes, that kind of thing. So over time, the more successful, more cooperative groups will outcompete and out and replace the less cooperative uh, groups. I guess the um, challenges to that theory are you have to have cohesive groups, so you have to have throughout human history the groups need to be cohesive some people argue that uh, something like conformity might be a way of um, maintaining cohesive groups um, or something like punishment which punishes deviation um, and then over time you have to have some kind of group inheritance so groups have to persist um, over time and transmit their norms from one generation to the next for long enough for selection to, to act um, so I think cultural group selection is a great idea and can explain, um, probably explain lots of uh, group differences. But when you, I think, really need to get into the nitty gritty and think about how do groups stay together over time despite migration, like I was just talking about, um, what is the intergroup competition mechanism? Is it literal fighting and conflict or is it um, uh, economic outperformance? Um, but it kind of fits with, I guess, what economists talk about, say, inclusive um, institutions and extractive institutions. Um, um, but, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great idea um, and uh, works in theory. But um, uh, I think the field of cultural evolution needs to do a lot of work to mm -hmm. test whether it's been an important process in, in human history as well. So earlier you referred to the term uh, evoked culture and as far as I know it was introduced first by Tubi and Cosmedes in their book uh, The Adapted Mind, the, yeah. two, two of the main evolutionary psychologists out there, right? And it's interesting because it reminded me of another term that they talked about that was the standard social science model and uh, I remember also reading in your book about how uh, people in the social sciences traditionally talked about things like socialization and social influence and things like that, that were really very poorly defined and operationalized. And then it seems like uh, the mind was sort of permeable to any sort of influence and any sort of idea that people would put out there and that w we could structure our societies whatever way and it would work just by imposing things on people, for example. But, uh, I mean, that's not really the case, right? And approaches like the blank slateist approach or uh, extreme social, uh, socio-cultural constructionism uh, don't really work that well in terms of explaining where human culture comes from, how it evolves, and what is successful and what is not, right? Yeah, I think I would agree. I guess I would maybe place myself halfway between a continuum maybe of evolutionary psychologists and mm -hmm. 
um, people who emphasize genetically evolved aspects of cognition of mind, stone age brains, that kind of approach. And the standard social science model, as you say, at the other extreme, which is very blank slate and um, uh, I guess it's not really um, doesn't take a scientific approach to culture either, which is a different issue. So I guess cultural evolution and kind of um, try things from both. So we start with the assumption that, like I mentioned earlier, culture is an evolved trait and culture evolves um, as well. So it's rooted in the evolutionary sciences. It's also a science and uses the scientific, the scientific method. But I guess unlike maybe to being Cosmides and the um, certain strand of evolutionary psychologists, I guess cultural evolution folk argue that culture has uh, an a major ex explanatory role in shaping human behavior. So I guess evolutionary psychologists, maybe this is um, fair or unfair, would argue that culture is maybe a proximate mechanism, that um, it's uh, a mechanism by which genes cause human behavior to arrive at genetically adaptive equilibria. I guess um, cultural evolutionists argue that that's not necessarily the case and the adaptive function of culture is to deal with environmental circumstances and environmental change that happens too rapidly for genes to uh, to track because genes you, know, you get your genes when you're born and then you pass them on when you're um, when you if you reproduce uh, give them to your children and so there's this what Conrad Lorenz I think called generational dead time in between those two points when your genes can't know what's going to happen can't know what um, uh, what food to eat or where to uh, set up camp or various things and so the evolutionary function of culture and learning in general I guess is to deal with rapidly changing environments but because it does that that means it's necessarily divorced to some degree from genes genes kind of let culture off the leash in order to generate generally adaptive behavior which may in certain circumstances um, uh, go off in maladaptive or, or neutral directions um, so I guess in terms of the explanatory power of culture it's as cultural evolution is somewhere in between evolutionary psychologists and sociobiologists perhaps and uh, the standard social science model which say that culture is everything and, and genes is nothing um, uh, or genes are irrelevant um, but I guess the other distinction maybe is between the so standard social science model is this um, idea that cultural evolution we're trying to take a scientific quantitative um, approach to studying culture so I think um, maybe the criticism that you were taking from my paper maybe it was a bit harsh I guess things like socialization um, if you're just using verbal models and words um, I guess then that gets you so far but I guess what cultural evolutionists try to do is create mathematical models or computer simulations um, and run um, uh, sort of statistically um, driven observational studies or experiments use the tools of science to try and quantify what culture is or what, what is socialization when people acquire norms or attitudes what actually is how do, how do these norms or attitudes flow from individual to individual we can build models just like biologists build uh, mathematical models looking at how genes pass from individual to individual and the effects of selection those kind of things we can build models to try and understand uh, cultural change whatever word you want to use to call it cultural transmission social learning socialization to try and get quantitative a quantitative handle on how culture changes so for example conformity i mentioned earlier there are models of conformity so conformity would be where you preferentially adopt the most common trait uh, behavior in your group so if um, uh, you know 60 percent of people in your society do a then you have a, a more than um, 60 percent chance of adopting trait a whether it's um, using knives and forks or using chopsticks or something like that and so you can model that and you you can say when is that likely to evolve um, you know, when is conformity adaptive I guess it's adaptive when you're averaging across different people's um, flawed reasoning maybe if there are lots of errors that people are doing if you adopt the majority then you're gonna average over these errors and so that's adaptive to, to do conformity um, but if someone in the minority has a brilliant idea 
then if you're just being conformist, then you're not going to adopt that brilliant idea. So it can, under certain circumstances, lead to the not adopting the most optimal, the the adaptive trait. Um, but it does tie groups together, uh, generates this intergroup homogeneity. So I guess that's what the key distinction maybe between what social science communities um, do, which is similarly arguing that it's important, but what we're trying to do is take the methods of biology and the natural sciences and trying to understand culture, I guess, from a with a, a quantitative scientific basis to try and get a handle on what is cultural change, what is culture, what are the long-term population level evolutionary consequences of things like conformity or prestige bias, which is copying prestigious people, yeah. um, various other, this cultural group selection, uh, these, these kind of cultural processes. Mm -hmm. But it is crucially important for us to understand how our minds process information and then it could uh, either be through uh, the ways by which our brains got structured through processes of natural selection and then uh, we would get that there at its biological basis and for example by understanding how people deal with the physical world or the biological world and things like that is just coming to my mind things like core knowledge like folk physics folk biology, folk psychology, or theory of mind, and then also perhaps understanding some more, uh, how they call it, uh, domain general modules or general purpose mechanisms that we have operating in our minds, that those maybe could be more the result of culturally transmitted mechanisms or information, right? And, and that's crucial to understand how we deal with culture, how we transmit it to one another, and what is successful. Right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there are definite links with the, what evolutionary psychologists do. So um, some of my studies have used um, what we call the transmission chain methods. This is much like, I don't know what you call it in Portugal, but here we call it Chinese whispers. Some people call it telephone or broken telephone. Yeah. Basically pass, it's like a children's game. You pass, uh, not not the ones that we do in the lab, but children also play it. But you pass um, information along chains of people. So one person reads something, they recall it from memory, then give it to the next person, they read it, they recall it. And you look at the changes that occur to the information as it's passed from person to person. So it's simulating cultural transmission, cultural evolution in the lab. Uh, so some of the earliest studies I did using this method looked at what we thought were gen probably genetically evolved um, content biases. So aspects of genetically evolved aspects of the brain, just like evolutionary psychologists study, that um, filter information or, or select information that is probably genetically adaptive to, to pass on. So uh, early study of mine looked at social interactions versus non-social information. So anything to do with people or people interacting tends to spread very well along these chains. Um, sadly, I think I used as my non-social material global warming um, different global warming patterns which disappeared pretty quickly so people and this fits with Machiavellian intelligence or social brain um, theories that Robin Dunbar and Andy White and other people have proposed um, as um, explanations for our large brains we're basically attuned to social relationships and that's what's caused large primate and in particular human brains but that has generates us selection pressure on social information in cultural evolution rather than non-social Im information. So that's why people remember the events from the lives of Kim Kardashian rather than um, you know, what to recycle or things that are actually important for the future of the planet. Um, or other people have looked at disgust. Uh, so um, disgusting stimuli um, that evoke emotions of disgust tends to be transmitted very well along transmission chains. Again, this probably has a good genetic evolutionary basis because disgusting things cause disease and it's good to know what causes disease for your ultimate reproductive, um, for your um, biological fitness. Um, and exactly as you say, things like folk physics or folk psychology, these are also probably um, partly genetically evolved um, core knowledge capacities. Um, so uh, young babies are born 
Um, I guess there's all these looking time experiments. Young young babies look longer at physically impossible things rather than things that they've habituated to that that um, obey the rules of physics. So children seem to be born with some innate knowledge of physics, perhaps. Um, uh, that obviously structures how they they learn about the world, but yeah. So then that then also translates into these more general learning processes like conformity, the uh, the majority is doing, or prestige bias, copy whatever the prestigious person is doing. These are more domain general, um, and I guess if you're trying to explain how you get maybe from folk physics to quantum physics then you need these general purpose, these domain general biases. So quantum physics, for example, is completely unintuitive. Yeah. String theory, something like that, you know, strings vibrating in 16 dimensions or whatever. There's no genetically evolved modules or core knowledge that could possibly help us understand string theory or quantum physics. We need to go to university, a cultural institution, and learn from the prestigious physics professor who's published lots of papers and is a, a professor of physics at, what, at the university. Um, we need to sort of overcome almost our intuitive, genetically evolved understanding of physics, get rid of that, and replace it with um, quantum physics. That's where the domain general social learning biases come in, and this is the uh, cumulative culture that I was talking about earlier. So this might actually be, might actually explain why humans uniquely have cumulative culture. It's these domain general biases that allow us to go beyond um, uh, our core knowledge, beyond our domain specific genetically evolved mental modules, and get to quantum physics or even evolutionary theory itself, which is unintuitive, or all these unintuitive scientific and technological. Um, ideas that um, require just, um, I guess, trust in professors or trust in um, the dissenter on, on YouTube or learning from these these respected sources of information and putting our genetically evolved domain-specific biases uh, aside. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely both. Uh, I guess it depends on what you're trying to explain and um, to explain everything from babies understanding of objects falling off tables right through to quantum physics you need to understand both the genetically evolved basis of our cognition but also um, you need to understand the uh, process domain general processes of cultural evolution that allow, allow us to go beyond that that core knowledge i think Mm -hmm. So, at the beginning of your answer, you referred to the transmission chain method that is one of the methods that we can use in the lab to study, to study cultural evolution and cultural transmission. Uh, and I would like to ask you more about that because uh, there are different approaches that we have to study these phenomena. Uh, so, uh, some approaches are done in the lab and others are done in the field, let's say, like ethnographic studies and uh, they have uh, different strengths and weaknesses right and for example uh, I remember that in your book you talk about internal and external validity issues so could you tell us about that what, what those issues are about and then maybe the uh, the types of knowledge that we can obtain from different sources, the ones in the lab and the ones in the field, and how to integrate them properly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so internal validity, I guess, is the control you have over what you're doing. So the, the extreme end of internal validity might be a mathematical model. You write down the equations. You have complete control over the equations that you're writing down. Um, you can solve the equations or do a computer simulation, so you have control over over everything internally within the method. At the other end, external validity is um, the degree to which um, uh, you're studying the real world, I guess. So if you have high internal validity with the models, mathematical models have high internal validity, but the downside is that um, they're only as good as the assumptions or imagination of, of the modeler, usually. Um, and so at the other extreme, you have, uh, say, like you said, ethnographic methods, observational methods, where anthropologists go out and study an actual society as people live in their, in their lived, um, uh, lived environments. Um, 
and that has our external validity because you're actually studying people in their in their natural societies but it has low internal validity because um, often you can't sort of randomly assign people from across different villages and I guess you can do sometimes do randomized control trials but usually you can't sort of uh, take babies and move them from one village to another or one to another much as we would like to uh, ethics boards don't um, allow it or we can't uh, there's often um, imperfections in the data we get from field works, ambiguous answers, or people aren't there on the day that we go. Um, and so they have high external validity, but low internal validity. I guess lab experiments have a bit of both. So lab experiments, we can control what people are exposed to in the lab. Um, we can manipulate conditions, put people into control conditions and experimental conditions. Uh, but obviously the lab is always going to be to some degree artificial so it's not doesn't have as high external validity as studying people as they're living their lives in the field I guess the other big one might be historical data so historical or archaeological data um, it's real data from the real world but we can't again run experiments on history we can't rerun European history to see if the same countries emerge so I guess it's a continuum, there's no single perfect method. I guess what I argue in my book and um, in my, my papers is that really you need all methods. You need um, the methods that are high in internal validity to check the logical consistency of theories and understand what their implications are. Um, <clears throat> you need the ethnographic methods to actually test the theories in the real world. Experiments are useful because you have a mix of control and you're actually studying real people and real people's cognition. Um, um, but really the trick is to use all of the methods and I guess um, I think maybe a limitation of the social sciences as they are at the moment is that disciplines often only ever use one method so psychologists only run experiments or anthropologists, cultural anthropologists only use ethnography um, uh, and so I guess what I've argued is that if we want a proper understanding of human culture, of cultural change, we need to use a whole range of methods that vary in their internal and external validity and try to integrate the methods and maybe disciplines need to be reshaped or retrain people will need to be retrained to be able to converse in in multiple uh, methods i guess that's kind of why i um, point to maybe um, evolutionary biology so if we think about biology they kind of did this in the the 1940s uh, maybe with the the modern synthesis evolutionary synthesis where uh, paleobiologists and came together with um, uh, mathematical modelers who came together with ecologists and geneticists and um, uh, experimentalists and this synthesis occurred in the 1940s within biology where everyone realized they were just kind of studying different aspects of genetic evolution um, using different methods and there's still separation um, between different sub-disciplines of biology but they're all biologists and they would all subscribe to um, uh, Darwinian uh, evolution so there's a sort of theoretical common ground whereas in the social sciences we don't have that sadly different disciplines have different not only methods but also theories and um, anthropologists have their theories and psychologists have their theories and there's no grand overarching theory of uh, human culture uh, and I guess in my book I argue that we can have the same Darwinian evolutionary synthesis perhaps in the social sciences if we think of culture as evolving so this idea of culture as social transmission social learning it forms an inheritance process um, and there's variation and there's uh, selection and so you can think of cultural change as an evolutionary process and just like that stimulated a synthesis in the biological sciences maybe that can stimulate an interdisciplinary synthesis in the social uh, sciences and so we all start coming together a bit more and realize that psychologists and anthropologists and historians and archaeologists and sociologists were all studying the same thing, um, cultural change, just with different methods and with different time scales, and um, uh, maybe we can get a bit more interdisciplinary collaboration uh, in that sense.
Mm -hmm. So you also referred there to the modern synthesis in uh, evolutionary biology or the modern synthesis in uh, evolution by natural selection that has to do with biological slash genetic evolution. But since we're using the term cultural evolution here, um, in what ways is it similar to the traditional modern synthesis in genetic slash ev uh, biological evolution? And in what ways does it differ from it? Yeah, it's a good question. So I guess myself and others building on um, work really by Rob Richardson, who I think you've spoken to, mm -hmm. and uh, Luca cavalli Sforza and Mark Feldman, I guess they laid the groundwork in the 70s and 80s for this idea of cultural evolution. Actually, I should um, maybe go back a bit. So actually Darwin talked about cultural evolution um, in The Descent of Man. So I guess cultural evolution is the idea that cultural change can be seen as a Darwinian evolutionary process that acts in parallel to genetic evolution. So if we go back to the origin of species and, um, and Darwin, he argued that evolution is a uh, variation, variation between individuals, for example, you need um, some kind of uh, inheritance. So these, this variation is inherited from one generation to the next, one individual to another, and you need some kind of uh, selection process. So not all variants are equally likely to be inherited, um, and there's various reasons why some are more likely to be to persist and be inherited than others. So I guess in my book and papers, I've argued that you can apply the same, those exact same principles to culture. So you have cultural variation, people differ in their attitudes, in their customs, in the languages that they speak, the tools they use or whatever. You have inheritance. In this case, it's not genetic. It's this social learning, the definition that we started our conversation with, <clears throat> imitation, language, teaching, that kind of thing. And you have some kind of selection like process where not all tools are likely to be uh, transmitted to the next generation. Not all words are equally likely to be learned by children. Uh, not all um, attitudes are likely to be held in society. So there's some kind of selection process changing the, the cultural variation over time. So in this sense, we can say that culture evolves because it has these Darwinian properties of variation, inheritance, and some kind of selection process. Um, I guess in my book as well, I argue that um, uh, we shouldn't go too far because the specifics of, um, I guess, the, the neo-Darwinian neo um, evolutionary synthesis don't really apply to culture. So when we start thinking about Mendelian inheritance, um, or um, you know, we get DNA from two people, our mother and our father, you know, those are the details of genetic inheritance which don't transfer over to cultural evolution. So obviously we can get our attitudes, our ideas, our knowledge from many people as well as our parents, from our teachers, from our professors, from the TV, from the internet, from the dissenter. Um, so there's many multiple routes of cultural transmission um, and these things like conformity or prestige bias, these don't really have a clear parallel in genetic evolution uh, so much. So these, we might say, are these sort of unique rules of cultural evolution. Uh, might even say that uh, cultural evolution is Lamarckian in the sense that we uh, sort of take ideas from others and we transform them due to our innovation or, or, or cognition and then pass them on to another, um, which isn't actually as un-Darwinian as is often made out because Darwin was a Lamarckian. If you go back to, to his writings, he thought genetic evolution was, was Lamarckian, a bit confusingly. But I guess the, the overall thing is, you know, cultural evolution, I would argue, is Darwinian in that it's variation, inheritance, various selective like selection-like processes, but the details are different. And the exciting thing, I think, about studying cultural evolution is that it's not just blindly taking population genetic models from biology and applying them to culture. It's actually studying cultural change and thinking about um, you know, how do these cultural variants change, increase in frequency compared to these? Um, how can we model these processes like conformity that biologists um, haven't got in their theory? Um, and how do we fill in the details of cultural change? Again, using mathematical models, using experiments, using historical data, using ethnographic um, data. Um, so I guess that's that's yeah another 
way, as we've been talking about, another way in, in which culture and biology fit together in the cultural evolution approach. It's that culture itself is an evolutionary process um, that co-evolves with genetic evolutions. So this is this idea of uh, co-evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also that issue about the unit of selection in cultural evolution, because uh, there isn't really any unit there, right? Like in biological evolution, where we have the gene. And I think it was even unfortunate that Richard Dawkins came up with that metaphor, uh, the meme for cultural evolution, because it doesn't seem to me at least to be that useful to talk about that in cultural evolution. I mean, a discrete unit of culture. Right? No, and I guess, yeah, memetics hasn't really taken off as an empirical science. Cultural evolution, I think, has taken off more broadly, but memetics, um, I guess Susan Blackmore wrote um, The Meme Machine uh, in the 90s, following up on Richard Dawkins' ideas in The Selfish Gene. Um, but, yeah, there are no associate professors of memetics that I'm aware of. There's lots of us studying cultural evolution. Probably, I guess my opinion is cultural change might be uh, based on a discrete replicator or it might not. We just don't know. Really, memetics is about how information is stored in the brain um, and we don't know enough about how information is stored in the brain in order to say whether it's stored in a particulate uh, manner similar to Mendelian genetics. Um, I guess that's for future neuroscientists, the sort of future cultural Watson and Crick to come along and win the Nobel Prize by figuring out whether what the nature of cultural inheritance is. Um, but at the moment, we just don't know enough about how the brain works to say whether cultural inheritance is particular or not. And I guess you don't really need to commit to that in order to study cultural evolution. So all you need is variation and you need to understand how that cultural variation changes over time, um, but you don't need to assume that that variation comes in discrete particles, units of information that are transmitted in an all or nothing uh, manner. So people like Rob Boyd and Joe Henrich and Pete Richardson have models of uh, continuous cultural variation that is evolving over time. Um, and so you can have interesting, um, realistic cultural dynamics without assuming particular inheritance. But yeah, you're right. I guess memetics uh, for me is uh, not a dead end. It's just a, um, a, uh, a road that hasn't been pursued because of our lack of understanding of, of neuroscience and may be pursued in the future, but you don't need to have an understanding of memetics to study cultural evolution. Just like Darwin came up with his theory of evolution, yeah. knowing nothing about genetics, really. Um, so Mendel was doing his experiments in parallel, but Darwin, um, I think the famous story is Darwin had Mendel's manuscripts um, on his shelf, but the pages were uncut. He never actually uh, read Mendel's work and knew nothing about genetics. Doesn't stop you studying uh, evolutionary um, processes like, like cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these theoretical differences between cultural evolution and genetic evolution, but then, it, it, interestingly, there are some methods that you can apply both to biological and to cultural evolution. Like, for example, you talk about in your work about uh, phylogenetic methods that you can use to reconstruct, for example, the evolution of certain pieces of technology. And that, that's very interesting. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it's not something I do myself, but I've uh, certainly written a lot, of, a lot about it. So I guess this was, <clears throat> well, so I guess, again, we can go back to Darwin. So the only uh, diagram in the origin of species um, that Darwin drew was a branching tree. Um, and he had this hypothesis con contrary to, I guess, ladder-like theories of the time of Herbert Spencer and others, which saw evolution as moving from one stage to another. Darwin explicitly saw evolution as a branching process. So life diversifies over time, diversifies and diversifies, just like branches of a tree. So I guess during the 20th century, biologists took that and again quantified it, used quanti quantitative scientific methods to try and quantify how species evolve and diversify over time, either from current, so you've got current species distributions or you've got fossil records 
and you try and reconstruct how they evolved, reconstruct the tree going back um, about how species diversification occurs. So I guess beginning in the 1990s really, Mark Pagel and Ruth Mace in um, anthropology and uh, I guess Mike O'Brien and Mark Collard and other people in archaeology took these methods and applied them to cultural data sets. Um, so um, uh, Pagel and Mace applied it to, I think, uh, camel keeping. So you've got distributions of some societies in Africa keep camels, others don't keep camels. And you can use the same kinds of methods to try and reconstruct the likely evolutionary history of camel keeping. Was it one society that invented camel keeping and then all the other societies that now keep camels are descendants of that one common ancestral society? Or did camel keeping independently evolve in different tips of the, the tree? So you can, which is the same kinds of questions that biologists are interested in. So here the um, inheritance is cultural. So this is all cultural evolution. Cam genes for camel keeping. These are traditions, agricultural techniques that are passed from individual to individual through social learning, cultural transmission. But you can equally take a, um, a historical approach and try and understand the evolutionary history of these traits. The archaeologists do it. Um, so Mike O'Brien and Lee Lyman and others have looked at uh, arrowheads, projectile points across North America and tried to reconstruct how they um, again, spread across North America, how you explain the diversity um, across different um, parts of North America, um, basically using the same or very similar quantitative methods uh, that biologists use to understand how species diversify and change over time. Um, so that's the, again, it all rests on this analogy uh, between genetic evolution and cultural evolution um, uh, with inheritance the, the common um, the common uh, mechanism. So it's all about inheritance and diversification over time of variation in response to selection and drift-like uh, processes. So it's it's very much pursuing the analogy, but taking a broader view than uh, than lab experiments. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't want to take much more of your time, Dr. Mazudi. So before I ask you the last question that I have, le let me just ask you specifically about this issue because I haven't addressed it yet with any other person that does work in cultural evolutionary theory that I had on the show. That is the Galton's problem. And I guess that this is very important to talk about because sometimes people bring it to the discussion when we're studying different cultures or different societies and even, uh, I know that you don't study this, but just to give a quick example, there's recently been the, the, these uh, continuous findings about what people call the uh, gender equality paradox, where it seems that as people move from less gender equal societies up to more gender equal societies, the differences between men in, and women in terms of occupational choices and even certain personality traits get exaggerated. And then there are people uh, that criticize those types of studies because they say, oh, but uh, for example, Scandinavian countries, uh, though, uh, I mean, you can think that they have a different culture, but they don't uh, really, the, they are under uh, the patriarchy or something like that. I mean, whatever the arguments people come up with, but, but uh, in a sense, I mean, we have uh, also when we're studying culture to address that problem, but maybe sometimes um, cultures or societies m might not be that independent from one another as we think. Right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's the crux of Galton's uh, problem. So I think it was Francis Galton in the late 1800s who first uh, commented on it uh, as anthropologists started studying different societies and looking at associations between things across societies. I forget what Galton was commenting on. I think it might have been something like patriliny and keeping cows or something. So um, people observed that societies that keep cows are more likely to be patrilineal, so um, inherit wealth down the male line. I guess Galton's point was that 
exactly that. So societies are not necessarily independent data points. So you can't just look across all societies and do a regression or a correlation and draw a line between lots of dots on a, a scatter plot um, because that requires that that assumes that different societies are statistically independent and each one has a separate history. So I guess Galton argued an alternative explanation is that they're all all the societies that have say cows, uh, cattle keeping and patriliny, they all descend from one single society that happened to have cows and patriliny and so they're not all independent tests of that theory, they're all the same data point basically just specified. Um, I guess I don't know about the gender um, the gender debate, I couldn't speak to that, but it certainly has come up in the, the pathogen example that I mentioned earlier, so people arguing that uh, East Asian societies are more collectivistic because they have a history of higher pathogen loads and this idea that if you've got lots of pathogens you should shun outsiders because then you don't get diseases because people have criticized those examples for not taking into account uh, Galton's problem so they tend to treat Korea and Japan and China um, and Malaysia and different societies in East Asia as separate data points and they treat exactly as you say European countries, Sweden, Denmark, um, Norway, Finland as separate data points when actually you should cluster them together, you should control for their historical relationships which is exactly what phylogenetic comparative methods uh, do. So actually you might only have two data points, Europe and East Asia and then drawing a line between two data points is a dodgy thing to do and very different to drawing a line between uh, along 30 data points. So Galton's problem um, I guess is this, yeah, societies, countries are not statistically independent because they may have uh, or may not have but may have a shared cultural history and you need to take into account that shared cultural history when you do any kind of correlation across societies or across um, uh, across across different countries. Yeah. But just quickly, are there any set of criteria that you can use to decide to cluster together different societies or to treat them separately or, or not? That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think people debate this. Usually in cultural evolution, phylogenetic studies, people use language families. Uh, so there's the best data we have on cultural relatedness, I guess, is language similarity. So you can... Um, if you're looking at um, uh, cow and uh, cattle keeping and patriliny in Africa, for example, you, you might construct a Bantu language family, and then that gives you an idea of how uh, closely related two societies are, how um, how long ago they share a common ancestor, and so you use that as your phylogeny. And then, um, if lots of societies that have very similar languages also um, are very similar in their cattle keeping and patriliny, then you might discount um, that association. Whereas if um, two societies that have very different languages um, have the, that pattern, then that's better evidence for a causal relationship between those two. Um, I guess that, again, depends on the quality of your language uh, database and assumes that language is a good representation of cultural history, both of which you can um, uh, contest as, as assumptions. But... Um, I guess going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think the nice thing about these kinds of studies and this kind of approach is that your your assumptions, those assumptions are explicit. You have to make them explicit in your quantitative model and someone else can come along and say, I don't agree with your assumption, I've changed the model, um, <clears throat> changed the assumptions and I get a different um, a different outcome. And that's kind of, uh, that's that's how science should, should proceed. Um, whereas uh, maybe less quantitative approaches to history might cherry pick examples or um, uh, come up with examples of, uh, from the literature without a kind of systematic, ex uh, systematic comparison of the data and without being explicit about their assumptions about how cultural evolution proceeds. Mm -hmm. So, just to put it simply, is basically uh, what is similar to what biologists do when they're looking at a specific biological branch and they're trying to uh, come up with data to distinguish between different species, right? Yeah, yeah. Biologists, I guess, use 
genetic similarity. Uh, mm -hmm. Cultural evolutionists often use um, linguistic similarity as a marker of, of, of cultural mm -hmm. evolution, but it's it's the same kinds of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a is there a causal link between two traits? Um, uh, is, is a common question. Does does one thing lead to another uh, thing in human history um, or in um, genetic evolution? I guess it's the same kinds of questions that people are addressing using the same these same methods, which are fundamentally based on Darwin's tree thinking that things diversify over time, um, and if we reconstruct the, the tree-like history of the genes and species or <coughs> cultures and um, cultural, culturally transmitted traits, then we can get a better understanding of, of um, genetic or cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. So let's go to my last question there. Earlier in the interview, you referred briefly to um, to how culture could be transmitted or in certain situations is transmitted via migration or migratory processes and i guess that you call that uh, in the literature uh, demic fusion uh, diffusion right when people move move between populations and it's that movement that they take the their culture with them and then transmit it to another culture instead of cultural diffusion where it's simply culture being transmitted through uh, uh, between two different populations for example without necessarily people moving from one population to the other and uh, in your work uh, i have a paper here that you published back in 2006 entitled how do people become weird? Migration reveals the cultural transmission mechanisms underlying variation in psychological processes. Uh, so could, could you tell us about what you studied there specifically and how migratory processes might affect how people in this case become weird or acquire a weird psychology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so WEIRD um, is a term, acronym uh, coined by Joe Henrich, Ara Norenzayan and uh, Steve Heiner, um, which uh, refers to people from Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. Mm -hmm. So they um, published a couple of nice papers arguing that most psychology research um, is uh, heavily biased because it almost exclusively studies people from these weird countries, from the UK, from the US, from Canada, from Australia, to a lesser extent, um, uh, uh, continental uh, Europe and very little of the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> so this feeds into cultural psychology, generally showing that um, one uh, source of pattern of Cultural variation is in thinking styles, so things like uh, what I mentioned earlier, collectivism, so valuing the group versus individualism, valuing um, yourself, valuing individuals is one dimension, or thinking in terms of or ex explaining behavior is another source of variation. So in uh, East Asian societies, uh, people commonly explain people's behavior in terms of the context or the situation. So if somebody fails an exam, they might say, oh, their questions didn't come up or they were feeling sick on the day, something like that. Whereas in the West, um, uh, we explain behavior typically in terms of uh, internal characteristics of the person. So if they fail an exam, it's because they're stupid or because they didn't revise enough because they're lazy. We appeal to internal disposition. So dispositional versus situational differences. So there are lots of these dimensions on which weird people differ from non-weird uh, people. Guess what that study was all about, was using migration as a way of trying to explain how this variation persists um, over time. Uh, so we were studying in that, in that particular uh, research, studying um, British Bangladeshi uh, migrants who um, the first generation British Bangladeshis born and raised in Bangladesh and moved to um, a small part of East London, uh, um, uh, Mile End or Tower Hamlets, um, and their children, so second generation British Bangladeshis um, uh, who were born and raised in the UK to first generation parents and uh, white British um, controls. 
So in that case, you've got people who grew up in a non-weird society, who are more collectivistic, who use situational uh, reasoning to understand other people, and they're moving to a weird society, who think in terms of dispositions and are more individualistic. So the question is, if these, I guess it goes back to your original questions, if these differences are maybe hardwired or genetic, you shouldn't see any change. Um, if they're cultural, uh, uh, in contrast, then you should, see, or I guess if they're evoked, then I guess you should see some kind of immediate um, change as people move from one society to another. If they're cultural, if they're socially learned, then you should see a gradual uh, shift as people gradually go to school or learn from different people in their workplace, that kind of thing. Um, so we found the last of those. We found a gradual shift. We found that um, the first generation showed some differences um, between the local, uh, the white the British. The second generation British Bangladeshis uh, shifted pretty much halfway from their non-weird parents to their weird um, white British um, peers at school or at, at the workplace. So we see this 50% shift, so people don't immediately shift um, or in response to their um, environment. They don't stay the same, so these things are not genetic because we saw this this 50% shift. Um, it's most likely cultural transmission as um, kids learn both from their parents but also from other people at school, from the mass media, from people in their workplaces, from various cultural sources. Um, and we um, made did some preliminary analyses trying to think about whether it's conformity or prestige bias, all these kind of things. So I guess. Uh, the point of the study was to try and explain you know, how do you get these persistent between society differences, between weird and non-weird, if you want to use that acronym, um, despite uh, migration. Because if you have migration and these things are fixed, then everything should become some homogenous mass. I guess the point of the study and other studies is that you don't uh, is that uh, immigrants rapidly shift from generation to generation by what's called acculturation in the literature through um, social learning. And so you can have migration, but you can maintain between group differences because people acquire the local um, values of their, their immediate um, society. So I think it's quite an interesting line of research that um, kind of speaks to, I guess this is the week that Donald Trump told um, a bunch of second generation um, immigrant Congress women to, to go back home. Um, and in the UK, we have our... Uh, Brexit issues, which is kind of partly driven by um, fears over immigration, but I guess these kinds of data speak to those debates and suggest that um, fears over immigration, fears that immigrants will come to a society and bring different cultural traits, um, while they often do, but um, those fears uh, may be uh, quite uh, unfounded and um, doesn't create some doesn't destroy cultural traditions because of this this acculturation effect as an example of thinking about how people learn from one another from one generation to the next to, to try and explain cultural uh, variation mm -hmm. okay excellent so uh, let's end the interview here dr mizudi and before we go uh, i will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview would you like to make reference to any websites where people could easily access your work or? uh i just i guess just google search for my name which is um fairly unusual and you'll find my website um i think it's alexmasudi.com where all my papers should be um, free to, to download that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will include that in the description box of the video. And uh, Dr. Mazudi, it was again a real pleasure to have you on the show. I really like talking to you. And I mean, maybe somewhere in the future we could do another one. I don't know. Sure, yeah, sounds good. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. 
I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervoz, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.